Thank you for joining us today. I am very happy to be here with you. I'm, I'm Nicholas King, the Associate Director for the Translational and Safety Sciences Program here at uh, the Critical Path Institute. And I work in, with the Predictive Safety Testing Consortium on our qualification efforts, as well as, as new projects that we're launching. And, and this is an area um, that we're talking about today. I think that that is very um, interesting and intriguing to uh, pursue um, along the lines of, of safety assessment. And so welcome, thank you for joining us. And let's look at our presentations and uh, uh, panelists on the next slide. Thank you. So today um, I will give a, a brief overview and, and welcome, kind of setting the stage for, for today. Some of the questions I'd like everyone to be, or, or uh, areas I'd like you to be thinking about questions. We will have a brief overview from the presentations that were that uh, we have pre-recorded for after this event. And then we'll move into a panel discussion with um, the panelists on the line. We, we have a, a, set, a group of excellent experts um, in, in safety assessment, as well as uh, people who are pursuing use of alternative solutions in safety assessment. And so with that, let me, let's go to the next slide. Actually go two slides forward. I want to start, um, you know, this is our, our, our 15 year anniversary of the PSTC's launch. And so in case uh, you aren't familiar with PSTC, I did want to give a little bit of a background briefly, and then we'll move into today's topic. So PSTC, we were formed in uh, 2006 in March. And what we aim to do is to bring together pharmaceutical companies to share and validate innovative safety testing methods. And then um, we, we do this under the advisement of the FDA, EMA, and PMDA by um, uh, interacting formally with the agencies on qualification of novel um, biomarkers primarily. And, and then we're beginning to explore how some of these different um, alternative solutions may, may fit into the paradigm of safety assessment and drug development. Uh, we, we all have the same goal, and that is to find improved safety testing approaches and methods in drug development. And um, our, our primary goal has been the, the qualification of novel translational, um, meaning uh, biomarkers at this point, safety biomarkers that may be used both non-clinically and clinically in drug development. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Just a little bit of a background uh, timeline of, of what we've accomplished over the past 15 years. Um, as I mentioned, we were started in 2006 when several pharmaceutical companies um, uh, found that they had a set of common um, data around use of um, novel safety biomarkers to detect drug-induced kidney injury in rats. And they were individually using these internally at their company and saw the value in coming together and collaboratively um, advancing these biomarkers for use more broadly and and not on an, on a case-by-case -case manner and so that was the initial impetus and in 2008 they saw the success via a qualification at the ema and fda of seven drug-induced kidney injury biomarkers um, for use in in rat uh, safety studies toxicology studies uh, with a case-by-case uh, -case, um, uh, approach for clinical use if uh, individuals come forward to the agencies. Then in 2010, we, um, we advanced uh, a little bit more with the third qualification of those biomarkers at the PMDA. And, and at, with that success, we began exploring different areas um, that have issues in, in safety assessment and toxicities, um, different tissues. And so we um, launched several additional uh, working groups. We'll go to that in the next slide, but we'll stay here for just a moment longer. Um, in 2014, we continued around um, further research and regulatory input with letters of support to further pursue two additional drug-induced kidney injury biomarkers. And then in 2015, um, we submitted a data set to the EMA and FDA for letters of support to um, further pursue and, and uh, demonstrated the value in a set of drug-induced muscle injury biomarkers. And, and here it's a, skeletal, a set of skeletal muscle injury biomarkers. In, in 2017, 
um, it with, uh, in collaboration with another consortium, we received letters of support from EMA and FDA on, on three different sets of biomarkers. Uh, one, one additional set with, with uh, drug-induced kidney injury biomarkers, a set with drug-induced vascular injury biomarkers, a very important area because there really are not a set of biomarkers um, to, to use clinically, and then a, a set of drug-induced liver injury biomarkers. And then in 2018, we received our first clinical uh, biomarker, safety biomarker qualification from the FDA, and that was for a, a, the drug-induced kidney injury composite measure with uh, a, a set of the biomarkers that had previously been qualified for use in rat toxicology studies. And so we've continued on that work. Let's go to the next slide. And you know, this has been our approach overall, is that we have a translational approach and we assess the, um, the, the novel biomarkers in, uh, in non-clinical species, including rats, non-human primates, as well as uh, dogs when, when possible. Uh, in these studies, it's, it, it is, uh, we, we usually use histology to compare the performance of the biomarkers to detect injury with uh, histopathology being the, the, um, the, the golden, golden standard there. And that's something that we can't necessarily do in humans. And so that's where we begin to look at the current standards that are accepted and compare the performance of our biomarkers to detect injury, uh, the novel biomarkers to what is currently accepted in, in the clinic. In a previous uh, uh, webinar and workshop, I think we went into a little more detail on this. And so if you're interested more in, in our translational approach, um, we can point you to some of those slides. All right, let's go to the next slide. So these are the areas that we've focused our, our research um, currently. And um, it is primarily because a, a lot of the, the current biomarker standards um, either don't exist in a few cases or, or they have some uh, limitations around the sensitivity or specificity to detect um, injury in that specific tissue. And so in the kidney, um, you know, the, the traditional safety biomarkers, you really only see changes when, when there's about a 50 to 60% um, loss of kidney function. Uh, in, in skeletal biomarkers, um, they, they are a little bit more insensitive than we'd like as well as nonspecific. And then in the liver, um, again, it's, it's not sufficiently sensitive and specific um, and, and do not always adequately de discriminate um, you know, adapter, uh, adapters from patients at high risk to develop liver failure. In, in the vascular system, the, there is an issue of, of not having a, a real set of biomarkers for detecting drug-induced vascular injury. And so if we see a signal in um, a non uh, a non non-clinical species um, that really, and, and are not able to monitor for that in humans, it is going to uh, limit further, further application of new therapies and development. Um, and in, uh, in, in testicular toxicity, there, there aren't any circulating biomarkers for seminiferous um, tubule toxicity. And then in, in the pancreas, um, we are uh, you know, looking to Im improve the specificity of detecting injury in the in the pancreas when, when injury occurs there. And so, you know, that, that brings us to the end of, of where where PSTC has pursued safety biomarkers, fluid safety biomarkers over the past 15 years. And with um, a goal overall of also looking at how we can, you know, reduce the three R's in um, in, in safety assessment and, and toxicology. And so let's go to the, the next slide. So the, you know, today's objectives, you know, we'd really like to discuss and explore some of the new approach methodologies that are applicable to safety assessment. And then as well, discuss how these new approach methodologies may, may supplement or replace existent uh, safety assessment models. And then as well, identify appropriate routes for adoption of new approach methodologies. Um, you, you know, we'll, we'll see several terms used sometimes interchangeably today, uh, alternative solutions, new approach methodologies, um, complex in vitro models, um, and, and, and then we'll go into a little bit of some detail on some of those as well. But overall, I think it's looking at how these, um, these new approach methodologies fit into the, the paradigm of safety assessment and how they um, may add value in the future to, to drug development.
All right. So on the next uh, over the next few slides, I wanted to kind of touch on a few recent publications you know, that have uh, been out in the space that are relevant to today's talk. Um, the first one was a was a publication by uh, a group of in 2017 by a group of scientists from 13 pharmaceutical companies. They published a, a consensus view on the progr on a progression strategy to facilitate and accelerate the adoption of, of organ or tissue on a chip uh, models in drug development. And, and one of the pieces that they did is they laid out this very nice um, graphic across um, the drug development landscape from, from target ID and validation to, through to preclinical safety. And then looking at the, the various testing requirements as well as the um, you know, a, a potential tissue on a chip context of use. And so I think this is a really nice place to, to begin. And, and one of the other pieces that they identified in this is that advancing um, these models is going to require partnership um, across the industry and, and academia in order to um, have the appropriate bandwidth and, and, um, and, and, not, and expertise um, to, to advance these in a manner that's applicable across drug development um, when, when we're looking at questions that are globally applicable to, um, to drug development and not just to an individual program. All right, let's go to the next slide. And in um, 2020, a group of uh, scientists at the FDA published uh, a manuscript talking about new approach methodologies and safety assessment. And they went through several different areas of safety assessment and identified key needs and, and different areas where, where they, they could be approached. And I uh, adapted one of their tables from this that I thought was applicable for today's conversation for us to, to kind of use as a guide, uh, a guide post. And so, you know, the first area is around safety pharmacology and, and some of the key needs are, are around, you know, refining the approach to improve identification of prorhythmic risk um, while reducing attrition of, of potentially useful drugs, um, looking at neurological screening, um, uh, to, you know, looking at protocols and statistical approaches to enable cross laboratory comparisons, as well as um, as well as looking at higher cognitive function and specificity, specificity of sensory tests. Um, in, in, in general toxicity, you know, it's around improving risk identification for rare or, or idiosyncratic toxicities um, and really narrowing down on looking at mechanisms of action and having appropriate um, um, new approach methodologies that, uh, that, um, that are applicable to those mechanisms of action or of injury. Um, you know, again, cardiovascular comes up here in terms of, of I think, some of the, the uh, in vitro models for assessment to, to uh, looking at functional endpoints. And then, um, you know, improving the approach to evaluating human relevancy of toxicity findings in animals. And I think that's one area that, that we'll see um, quite, um, uh, quite a bit in today's discussions. And then as well, um, you know, looking at, at animal models of disease for toxicology testing um, and identifying what is the appropriate context of use there. And then for, you know, kind of special toxicity, it's, um, you know, developing some val validated non-animal uh, non methods for assessing human skin sensitiz sensitization of mixtures. Um, not necessarily here is, is applicable in, um, in drug development, except for with topicals. Um, but I think a relevant component for today. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And I just, I really um, thought that this graphic was a great demonstration of the collaboration that's going to take to advance. Um, at least here, this is, you know, specifically looking at tissue on a chip, but the, the group that published in 2017 that you were at all um, paper really went through and, and identified the different components for advancing uh, tissue on a chip, um, the stakeholders involved, and then um, the, the different steps across. I know we've got these loading ports, um, the microfluidic channels are, are defining the context of use, um, the loading ports being partnerships, um, looking at, at platform capability development, cultured cells, um, characterization 
um, of the cell tissue composition, the physiological functions, response to injury, uh, perturbation, and, and pharmacological response. Then going through validation, so looking at the, the throughput capability, um, looking at changes within, inside a lab, uh, between labs, how reproducible is the model, and then as well as the stability of the platform, and then comparative effectiveness as well. And then finally, you know, looking at the, the connection to additional chips, commercialization in the long run, um, and then at that point, you're looking at data and, and decision management. And so with this idea of, of collaboration to advance this area um, applicable in drug development, I would like to move into our, our overviews of the presentations with our first speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Deidre Dalmas from GlaxoSmithKline. She's a scientific director there and, and a GSK fellow. Um, she works in their in vitro in vivo translation group and has been a co-chair to the vascular injury working group for several years now. I'm going to uh, give a presentation on the application of complex in vitro models in, in discovery and development, or at least an overview of that presentation. So thank you very much, Deidre. Thanks, Nick. And, um... Thanks um, everyone for joining today and, and, you know, participating in our discussion as we're moving forward to, you know, uh, you know, discuss how we can use these alternative um, solutions for uh, safety assessment. Do you want to move on to the um, next slide? And so what I will say, um, you know, before I start, and thanks for the introduction, Nick, is that in addition to uh, being involved in PSTC and um, working at uh, GSK. I'm also a member of the IQ um, Consortia and specifically which is the International Consortium for Innovation and Quality in Pharmaceutical Development and part of that there is an affiliate which is a microphysiological system. So I am a member of um, you know that working um, that affiliate as well as in addition to, to the others. So um, really just a high level overview of the, the presentation that hopefully you've all been able to uh, watch or will watch in the future is really how do we really adopt um, and make use of these alternative models and um, in the context of what I'll be discussing is really the um, complex in vitro models and how we can use those in, in those spaces and you know Nick did a, a you know a, a very good job of explaining some of the caveats to this and what will be needed in the, in the future. And again, I'll just again highlight some of those key features on, you know, as we're using these uh, models and, and moving forward, whether it's uh, 3D complex in vitro models, um, whether it has microphysiological components to that is really being able to build confidence in these models to be able to, uh, you know, make them applicable to, to that safety assessment and development space, that drug development space. And I'm um, trying to uh, really fully understand the translational relevance of, of these models in, in that space. And, you know, how they can be utilized. Um, again, looking at the context of use and, you know, if, if they are developed, can these be expanded as we move forward? Um, operationally, there are also, you know, some challenges in that space because as, as we know, um, these models are very difficult to, you know, develop. You have to have the right types of, you know, cells as, as Nick said and highlighted in, in those um, spaces. And there are a lot of individuals and companies that are working on this, whether it's, you know, within your own company or um, externally as, as vendors that are trying to help help develop, develop these that are more applicable across the various different um, um, lines and um, the various different spaces for the different organ systems. And again, how are we going to apply this, you know, in the future and what, what do we need to be able to do this? So if you want to move on to the next slide. So again, as I, as I mentioned, I am part of the IQ uh, Microphysiological Systems Affiliate. Um, and uh, part of this uh, platform uh, with this consortia is that there are various different working groups. And there was as a specific working group that is, was um, tasked with surveying the, the landscape and across the different companies on how they were using the various different microphysiological you know, systems and complex in vitro models. And this was really done over a period of time. There was an initial survey that was done in 2019 and again in 2021. So what is getting presented um, here over the, you know, the, the next, you know, two or three slides is really just a high level overview of some of the, you know, key take home messages. And again, there is a, um, more to come in that space. And there were a lot of uh, questions that were asked. So do keep your eye out, you know, as, as time moves forward, as that group is um, still collating all of that data, but we thought we'd share 
some of the highlights um, here today um, as it's applicable to these presentations. So really, you know, the overall goal was to really understand how the companies are using these, what is going to be developed, what the major challenges are in, in this um, area to be able to help realize the full potential of, of these complex type in vitro models. And um, these surveys generally focus on the platforms and the design aspects of the, you know, of the, um, the groups. And over the 2019 and the 2021 survey, there were different focuses. So initially in the 2019 survey, um, this really focused on complex in vitro models and what you can see across the bottom of the screen really was the various different types of models that were included in these surveys. So as we you know, go over the next two slides or so, um, this um, just keep in mind that the, you know, what, what these are in response related to, I guess. So in 2019, it was really uh, you know, more static type cultures and it pulled in some of the you know, flow components as you know, that's when you know, those components started potentially becoming uh, incorporated into, into those. And then in the 2021 survey, this really focused on more of the microfibrillological systems. And um, in order to answer you know, those questions, the companies were asked to really focus on um, their models that they were using in that space that do have that component to there. So whether it's organs on a chip or bioprinted tissues or you know, putting in you know, the various different flow type com components to hopefully be able to have it to be more translational to um, you know, the clinical you know, setting there. And um, based off of um, these surveys, um, there were 28 responses and 25 responses, and this these were sent out to the various different affiliates of the uh, IQ Consortia. Do you want to move on to the, the next slide? And so some of the highlights from the 2019 surveys, and this is the one that really focused on the complex in vitro models on a whole, was that, um, you know, folks at the various different companies and you know the developers were really applying these and trying to apply them equally for safety you know ADME as well as pharmacology and these um, resources were really segmented across the various different companies where the sources that um, these models were really coming from again was vendors academic uh, areas and you know internally and you know where where things are at now based off of the you know 2021 you know, survey as well is, you know, there's a lot more of, I would say, internal focus and internal groups that are also making, working in these areas and in the companies trying to develop these models and, you know, really trying to understand, you know, how, how folks are using this, whether they're looking from a human perspective or a non-clinical perspective when they're developing these with the, you know, overall goal is to really develop translational models that do, you know, apply to the clinic and, Back in 2019, and what I'll show you in the next slide, is that there was limited interest at that time in multi-organ integrated systems. I, you know, and and just my you know opinion there would be that you know this was starting to you know get developed, getting developed over many many years, and you know this is a very fast um, evolving uh, area, and um, so you know in a few years ago, you know folks were really focused on. You know, can we get the you know single organ model systems developed? And very quickly, I think it was realized that there needs to be multi-organ components to those. Um, these again in 2019 were used across various different modalities. And then one of the key highlights for the um, 2019 survey is that again there needed to be additional characterization, various different experiences across the companies to be able to be able apply these, you know, moving forward to the various different areas, especially um, safety assessment. Do you want to move on to the, the next slide? I have um, maybe one more after this one. Um, and then from the 20, sorry, go back one sec. If you want, from the 2021 survey, um, what some, what the key, I would say, take some highlights are um, from the survey that we're um, sharing today is that, you know, the top four, you know, categories of, you know, complex in vitro models and the organ systems that were um, important to individuals and the pharmaceutical companies, as well as in 2021, were the same across, the, across those areas. So really, it's the liver, the GI, the kidney, and the CNS, and, you know, they, they seem to be, you know, the major focus across the areas. Um, in 2020, in the 2021 survey that is really focusing on, you know, more of those microfiliological systems, multi-organ integrated um, systems are of greater interest now versus in, in the past. And with liver really being, um, 
wanted to be integrated and folks having the most interest of, of doing that with the other organ systems. And the second highest there was um, the immune system and integrating the systems with, with immune components. And then um, as we, you know, are moving forward, it's generally how the question is, you know, how do we qualify these models? How are we using these models? And how are companies using these to potentially you make decisions? And that um, just looking at the image there on the right hand side of you know how folks are looking at this, one of the key, I would say, features and um, outputs of this is that what you can see is from a regulatory permissions perspective from 2021 you know the responses are you know rather low there with uh, you know zero and you know in 2019 there was also you know there was a, a small amount of individuals who are using this and just to point out that this is likely potentially you know maybe due to the fact that just the focus of, of the survey and that you know these comp um, molecules are getting and these models are getting to be more complicated as we're moving forward and there needs to be you know a lot of um, additional discussion i would say in the future on how these can apply in that regulatory you know pers you know um aspects of that and i think that's what you know some of the reasons why we're here today you know talking about how we can potentially move forward in the, in this space um if you want to move on to the next slide and then again you know based off of um, you know what I just said and, and these various surveys and again there's more responses to come um, from that but you know there are still a lot of unmet needs and a lot of questions to be able to use these models and you know as, as Nick said and I, I mentioned before is you know what really is needed to be able to have confidence in these across the, the different areas how um, what is needed to be able to have the translatability between animals and humans do we really need to have an animal to human translation? Is it sufficient to have complex in vitro models that are very focused on, you know, the human aspects? Or, you know, are we looking to have, you know, the ability to be able to potentially, uh, you know, replace, you know, animals, understand that um, the models really do recapitulate both and that um, the aspects that we are including in them are, are translatable. And then how, how do we use this? You know, as Nick mentioned, the context of use, um, you know, really understanding for each of the models how we can apply that to the, you know, research and development paradigm and, you know, what, you know, what do we need to do for, say, qualification of a model? Is a single model useful um, that, a, say, a company, you know, develops, a vendor developed, develops? Is, are the characteristics of that model, I would say, um, qualified and then can be applied to other models as long as they follow that? So I think there's just a lot of you know, additional questions just, um, you know, based off of, you know, the various different presentations and, you know, some of the answers to the survey that we have. And then again, looking and working with the health authority and, you know, partnering with them, as we'll hear, you know, a little bit, you know, later from the FDA. And so, you know, what do we really need to do in this space? What are the companies thinking they need to do? How, you know, are the uh, health authorities going to be able to, you know, have, what are they going to do to interpret this data? And really, what kind of impact is this going to have on, on the, you know, clinical development, you know, moving forward? And there's some of the questions that I would say for this, um, uh, you know, presentation in this uh, series of our conversation today as to um, just kind of throwing out there some key aspects of um, some maybe discussion points that we can highlight. Do you want to move on to the next? There you go. So thanks, everybody, for your time. And um, you know, there is the, a larger presentation and hopefully everybody gets a chance to uh, listen to that in, in the future if you already have. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, DJ. That was excellent. Um, setting us up with, with looking at what the, the IQ MPS um, affiliate is working on in, in this space and, and how it applies with, uh, with PSTC as well. Uh, I am going to give a little bit of an overview of what Lauren Lewis is uh had has a presentation on and she lauren lewis is our one of our co-chairs for the nephrotoxicity working group and that group does have a specific sub team looking at in vitro models and she wanted to provide um a, she has an, a presentation looking at what this group is working on as well as the other scientific focal points within that working group so let's go to the next slide in, in the nephrotoxicity working group, they are currently focused on three different areas. The first 
um, here that we have is, is, is what we come today, together today to discuss, and that is exploring the role of in, in, in vitro models to detect drug-induced kidney injury. Um, and, and in order to, for, to explore that, they are they are conduct they have a, a landscape analysis that they are conducting and they continue to to look across the landscape in terms of what uh, is being researched and developed. They also are sharing and comparing the the various experiences across our membership um, it, with in vitro models, and then we are exploring a, a collaboration. We actually have a, an ongoing collaboration with the IQ MPS affiliate on on assessing some of the models that are out that are out in development at various vendors and then the final piece is putting together and assembling a research plan for assessing biomarker response um, that in in vitro models and i think that's one of the key pieces that we'll that we'll come back to discussing is what you know what is the output from um, new approach methodologies that is appropriate for um, for for safety assessment and as well for, for looking towards um, drug development and where we would want to have re uh, regulatory input on these assessments. The, the other two areas that the, the working group are, are involved in is a clinical qualification of our kidney safety biomarkers. And that is um, looking at a panel of safety biomarkers in the context of use of liable there. Um, they, they have one final study that they're going to use to support the trend, our translational approach. And that is uh, a non-human primate study using tobermycin um, to induce nephrotoxicity. And then as well, they are uh, working, we are working on, on several publications from some of our prior non-clinical studies. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so, you know, overall, um, the, they are evaluating the kidney in vitro model landscape to better understand available systems for the assessment of drug toxicity. Um, the collaboration with IQMPS is going on. There was uh, there there was a request for information on kidney microphysiological system testing for specific contexts of use in drug development that did close in early August. And we're going to begin reviewing those um, those applications here in the near future jointly with them. And then as well, you know, we are creating research plans to uh, to develop and validate renal in vitro models. Um, in the future, we uh, we do have one collaboration that's looking at a proximal tubule stress-based model uh, that will also look at changes in uh, in Kim one in the effluent coming out of those of those models. All right, so that is a brief overview of of what the ne nephrotoxicity working group is pursuing in terms of alternative solutions in um, in safety assessment. I think we can go on to the next presenter. And if, uh, Laura, if you're able to make Madhu uh, unmute Madhu, I'd like to introduce Dr. Madhu Lal Nag. She, um, uh, Dr. Lal Nag is a program lead on the, uh, and the Research Governance Council at the FDA in um, CEDAR. And she has a presentation that she's going to provide an overview on around uh, understanding the utility of complex in vitro models in therapeutic development. So, um, Dr. Lal Nag, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And um, just let Laura know when to advance the slides. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. Um, can, can, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so, good morning. It's a it's a pleasure today for me to 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 be with this group, and and thank you very much for joining us to be a part of this discussion. Um, you know, from both the translational as well as well as a regulatory perspective of understanding the utility of complex in vitro models in therapeutic development. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, so as uh, Deidre sort of uh, beautifully pointed out, you know, um, we we all agree that you know we do need alternative predictive models. Uh, when you look at the entire continuum of drug development, from um, the amount of resources and time we spend with target identification and generating hits, to to actual approval. 
this is an extremely time and resource intensive process. And, and for both companies in this space, as well as the regulatory agency, the end game is the same, you know, to get better um, uh, therapies to patients faster, uh, keeping the rigor of the regulatory approval process the same. Um, between 20, 2009 and 2018, um, you know, especially in, in uh, when you think about uh, costs for cancer and immunology based indications, um, the average sum totaled 1.3 billion. So this and, and the numbers here are merely to drive home that, again, um, over time, we haven't decreased the amount that we're spending in R&D. And perhaps the utility of these complex in vitro models, especially in the investigative toxicology space, can really help us um, uh, pay more attention to both the time that it takes to get a drug to market as well as the amount that we spend in doing so. So with the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, uh, where I sit, um, Laura, can I have the next slide, please? We've been looking at these new approach methodologies, and um, especially in areas where no good safety pharmacology models actually exist. And, and Deirdre has given you a, a wonderful sort of introduction into the different areas that um, um, the IQMPM, IQM, um, MPS is, is focusing um, uh, as is, is the Critical Path Institute. Within CEDA, we, we the, the, the pharmacology and the toxicology space with the Office of New Drugs, as well as the Division of Applied Regulatory Science, work together to really help us develop pathways that can adhere to the three R's, uh, reduce, refine, and reuse for, for animal models, as well as to contribute to the development of novel predictive models without changing the current paradigm. So I really want to stress, and, and you know, hopefully you'll get a chance um, uh, to, see, to see more of the presentation, but um, I, I do really want to stress that at this point, the entire community in the pre-competitive space, uh, both so that's ac academic groups, uh, uh, pharmaceutical um, industry, and, and the regulatory industry, we're not seeking to to change the current paradigm as it exists now, but rather to augment it with predictive models to to therefore be able to go on in the future, in, in the near future, um, and to Deidre's point, to really understand what is the translatability of each model um, from animal to human, and where is it, um, um, you know, are we really able to define the context of use for each model, which is extremely important. So uh, with respect to both the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, but also the agency uh, as a whole, there is a plan to develop uh, the regulatory use of novel approach methodologies, which consists not only of um, complex in vitro models as alternative solutions, but also a combination of in silico and in vitro models. Um, and the idea really is to work together with all the stakeholders to come to a consensus on the context of use of NAMs and their utility in drug development. Next slide, please. So as, as this group sort of needs no introduction to, um, um, all models are wrong, but there some models are useful. And, you know, this was a comment that was made by a very famous mathematician, and, and it still holds true in many different, um, in many different areas today. Um, for a lot of go, no go decisions, um, over time, we've, you've, we've used two-dimensional cultures and it's just sort of slowly moving into the space of 3D organoids and then incorporating flow and tension into microphysiological systems with the hope that we're really able to model multi-organ physiology. But instead of developing catch-all models, I go back to Deidre's point about context of use. I think it behooves us as a community to really understand the different, uh, the different, um, uh, uh, on the different questions, different biological questions about the normal and the disease state that we seek to model and then develop assays and systems to, to answer those particular questions and use a series of complementary models to really answer that disease specific question, whether you're talking about signaling, whether you're talking about target identification, whether you're talking about the, um, uh, the different um, um, in, in vivo uh, microenvironments that 
that you would encounter. I think we really have to think about developing a, a platform of models that then gives you an answer to a particular biological question. So what we seek to do really, I think, or what we should be seeking to do as a community is not to necessarily discard as a whole any system that exists, but really understand the utility and context of use of each particular system and see how you can build on a platform of physiological relevance and predictivity. Next slide, please. So within uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, the Division of Applied Regulatory Science, um, uh, Dr. Ribeiro, um, Dr. Strauss, um, and, and um, a, a few ORISE fellows have really been focusing on evaluating the potential of these systems for use in drug development with a specific sort of focus on um, obviously toxicity, but also drug absorption, distribution, and then uh, PKPD. The two systems that um, have been evaluated pretty extensively have been the cardiac chip as well as the liver on a chip where we're looking at the effect of investigational drugs on, on, on the function of the system, particular biomarkers and the phenotypic readout. For regulatory use, uh, that, that sort of sets the criteria for these evaluation systems must operate robustly, they must originate reproducible results and improve on the gold standard. And um, in terms of the, the criteria for evaluation um, and what would really um, allow a system to be recognized as being robust would be uh, a system that was preferentially used in different laboratories with commercially available cells as well as with um, sort of patient derived lines to be able to give the same result in different laboratories with different handlers time and time and time again. Uh, I can't stress enough that for as you increase the complexity and as you increase the physiological relevance, as we move to a space where we want this data to be accepted um, in the regulatory use and submissions, the robustness and reproducibility of these systems becomes paramount. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, what I uh, sort of mentioned on the previous slide, but would love to reiterate again, is that as you increase the complexity, the site-to-site -site variability really increases with microphysiological systems. So as a community, again, when we have complex in vitro models, when we have organ on a chip models, and we are, we are dealing with chip-to-chip -chip variability, we're dealing with site-to-site -site variability, uh, we're dealing with handler variability. Um, I think we also have to think about standardization of data. What does the data mean? What is the acceptable amount of variability that still gives us the same biological result that we, you know, we, we all agree on and, and, and trust uh, when, when looking at sort of um, the inclusion of this data into, into regulatory submissions. Uh, next slide, please. And for this brief introduction, I would like to conclude with what I believe is the most important thing. And, and I think Nick, you had sort of mentioned this, um, you know, in your introduction. I don't think this is possible without collaboration across the board. Um, all the stakeholders do have to come together in the pre-competitive space to really explore and establish these innovative new tools and concepts. Uh, regulatory agencies as well do have to come together with other stakeholders in the pre-competitive space to really be able to express to other um, other parties what the regulatory unmet need is with the with the use and inclusion of these complex in vitro models. Um, it is also instrumental as we move into more predictive models and into a more efficient therapeutic development process that safety assessment is continuously innovated so that we're able to address new challenges arising from these trends in drug development. And with that, um, I will leave you uh, with, with sort of um, uh, the thought that I think um, what is very heartening 
to see and to know is that regulatory agencies are now actively participating in being in, in wanting to contribute to um, the development of models that can be more predictive uh, for disease pathology as we move into sort of newer and emerging in, into the space of newer and emerging technologies and drug development. So thank you for your um, time and attention. Thank you very much uh, for all of those introductions. Um, as mentioned, um, the speakers that just highlighted those presentations, we, we do have full presentations that um, are available to all attendees to watch. So you'll receive a, a direct link with, to those presentations so you can watch um, those in their entirety. So just a quick reminder that uh, as we move into the panel discussion, you have the ability to ask questions of the group and those questions can be submitted through the Q&A function or um, you may raise your hand and we will call on you as we are able. And with that, I will turn it back to Nick to uh, uh, commence with the panel discussion. Great, thank you very much, Laura. So we have an excellent group of uh, participants here. And, and experts in this area. Joining us today, um, we have both of the, the pre prior uh, presenters, um, Deidre Dalmas and Madhu Balmag. Um, additionally, joining us, we have um, Xu Yan Liu, who is joining us from the Janssen Pharmaceutical Company. Uh, and then from Merck Company, we have two people joining us, Warren Glab and uh, Keith Tennis. So I'd like to, to welcome uh, our additional panelists. And if you'd like to take a moment to introduce yourselves briefly, let's go ahead and start with, uh, with Xu, Xu Yan. All right, hi everybody. Um, this is Xu Yan from Janssen Janssen. Um, so I've been working on mechanistic research for the drug-induced toxicity um, using obviously various in vitro models, simple model, 2D, 3D, uh, different models. So I'm um, very happy to have the opportunity today to discuss the uh, in vitro model uh, for safety testing. Great, thanks, thanks very much, Shia. And Warren. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Warren Glab. I'm at Merck and Co. here in West Point, Pennsylvania. I, I am the lead of the systems toxicology group within safety assessment and uh, interested in, in developing biomarker evaluations as well as regulatory endorsement of such biomarkers. Great, thank you very much. And Keith. This is Keith Tennis, also from Merck and Co. Um, been there for about 15 years supporting toxicogenomic research. Um, much of that time I was in the genomics group at Merck and then recently moved on into the preclinical safety organization, um, working under Warren, supporting um, toxicogenomics full-time. Great, thank you very much. All right, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to open it up right now to the the participants um, on, the, on our webinar today. If you have any opening questions, um, please do post those in the, the chat and Q&A section. And, and while you're doing that, um, Panelists, um, do, do you have uh, any opening questions as well that you'd like to discuss today? Thanks, Nick. Uh, Nick, this is Warren. Uh, you know, it's uh, not necessarily questions, but uh, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity with this team here to just kind of talk about not only some of these alternative solutions, but, you know, the in vitro models, et cetera. But, but really kind of get a feel for the, the regulatory endorsement piece, right? So, you know, we've discussed this previously. I think a lot of our member companies do a lot of these um, de-risking uh, preclinical sort of evaluations. Um, but I think it's really important that we kind of keep an eye on how we can collectively bring these together for further evaluation and or qualification and then really seek regulatory endorsement. Uh, I think that's the ultimate goal here and the, the strength of this, the group to, to really make sure that we keep an eye towards that regulatory piece. So that's something that we can maybe open up for discussion uh, unless there are other questions from the, from the attendees. Thanks, Warren.
All right, along those, uh, I guess with with or with that with that first question, um, uh, Madhu, perhaps you you know you have some ideas around regulatory you know questions that, yeah. that you would like to see addressed in in alternative solutions. Absolutely, and thank you, Warren, for bringing that up. You know, I I think you're absolutely right. Um, sort of having been on both. Um, you know, in, in both camps um, on, on the translation as well as the regulatory side. I, I think um, the, the participation of, of the regulatory agencies is extremely important in this space. Um, the Office of New Drugs actually has a new program. Uh, it's a pilot program that we just sort of got, got off the um, got off the floor. It's called the ICANT program, which is the Innovative Science and Technology Approaches for New Drugs. Um, so it, it's it's part of the um, the roadmap for the um, sort of described in the 21st century cures legislation uh, and was initially actually to your point about sort of understanding um, sort of biomarker development in in non-clinical models. It, it was originally uh, stood up for um, really understanding um, uh, the use that the use of, of um, uh, non non-clinical uh, models in, in therapeutic development and, and has actually progressed now to really understand tools that could advance our understanding of, of the way drugs work in different systems. So the use of tissue ships, microphysiological systems, as well as the development of novel non-clinical farm tox assays is part of this ISTAM program. And uh, what this program really seeks to do within the Office of New Drugs is to assess all of the all of the data that is used um, in in with, within pharmaceutical companies for go and no go decisions, and and really come to a consensus about what sort of data could be um, accepted, um, you know, and um, uh, accepted for evaluation within a submission. Great, thank you very much, Madhu. All right, kind of, uh, you know, a little bit along those the lines of these questions, this question so far, the other piece that, that I'd like to see input from um, from some of you, um, but I'll ask that now because we do have our first question here. Um, though, let's see, so the, the first question is, how will MPS perform with a shift towards protein and ol uh, oligonucleotide types of therapies? So looking at um, you know different therapies beyond small molecules and how that applies to utilizing uh, microphysiological systems. So, so this is um, you know Deidre hi from GlaxoSmithKline. I would say in in regards to um, you know the oligonucleotide type of you know molecules and those types of therapies, there is you know some work that is ongoing in that area and um specifically within the you know iq iq consortia and there has been um you know looking at the utility of the various different molecule uh, models that are out there and how they can be potentially adjusted or um being able to be applied in that space and um you know with with that being said there are specific aspects of certain models that are capable of being able to be used in in that space and i don't have all of them off the top of my head but um uh in regards to in regards to the iq there is a ongoing effort to pull information from that space together and a manuscript actually in that area um was just submitted um to alchex yesterday uh you know kind of highlighting and going over how uh, these complex in vitro models can be can be used in that area. So it, it is possible. There are some um, advantages and disadvantages of that, but it is something that is currently being looked at. And so I guess in, in that respect, I would say stay tuned, um, you know, for and looking out for say a publication in, in that space and hopefully some additional uh, you know, presentations in the future, you know, from, from that group on various different models that are now capable of being utilize like currently as we speak to, to help I you know identify and understand more mechanistic aspects of, of those types of models. Thanks, teacher. Anyone else have a response here? Nick, this is Madhu. May I may I go? 
I, I just had a quick, um, so, so I, I thought, thank you, Deirdre, for that response. And actually, I hadn't seen that publication, so I'm definitely going to um, look it up. Um, I think that is actually an excellent question because um, everything that we've seen so far has, as Deirdre mentioned, has been um, uh, optimized for small molecules, but when we think about therapeutics, you know, you're looking at you're looking at like uh, ASOs, you're looking at protein therapeutics, you're looking at ADCs, antibodies. You know, I think that as we understand more and more of the um, physiological complexity in a particular disease, and we start looking at it in context of the immune system as well, we will have to start thinking about how to um, how to um, uh, look at uh, modalities other than small molecules in these microphysiological systems. And that might, um, you know, require a whole different standard set of standards for the, the modality that we're looking at. So I thought that that, that was an excellent question. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone else on this question? All right, well, we do have another question here from our audience. Um, and this one is, Looking at, at current safety assessment for phase one, it, it relies primarily on the absence of effects. The lack of effects in animals or a large exposure margin implies safety in humans. Would a safety assessment paradigm based on NAMS use the same philosophy or would it also incorporate prediction of human effects? Um, I, I can take that. <laughs> I think um, uh, another, another great question and I would have to say that where we are with NAMS right now, it will depend on the kind of data that we're seeing. Um, I, I, I think the, like, as I mentioned, the focus on NAMS really right now is for areas where good safety pharmacology models do not exist. So we're looking at pregnancy models. We're looking at um, models of lactation, um, um, you know, the fetal maternal transfer. So these are areas that where I think we're we're beginning the focus because there there isn't a current reasonably acceptable standard of of sort of evaluating it. And and I I would say um, you know I would like to say that based on what we see coming in for that we would be able to um, we would be able to delineate what sort of uh, or you know, so what what sort of um, um, at, at least prediction for safe one, for phase one studies uh, we would we would accept for um, uh, sort of physiologically relevant and predictive models. Great, thanks. And and so then on on you know on the drug development side, what what do others you know? Where, where do you think um, incorporating prediction of human effects? fits into some of the work that you've, you've previously done or are working on at the moment. Yeah, Nick, this is Warren. Uh, so, you know, I think I, uh, if I if I pause for a second, I kind of think of three different bins for some of these new model systems, right? One would be internal decision making where we're de-risking de a molecule, bringing it into a, a preclinical safety assessment to make sure that it's relatively clean uh, or void of toxicities, liabilities. The second is where we're using some tool to understand the translation to humans, right? And that's where we would understand the potential risk. And I think that that's more in line with the question that I'm hearing, right? It, how would we use the tool to understand the human potential liability? That would be part of our integrated risk assessment and would be included in, in, in uh, an IND, for instance, right? Um, you know, the third part would be maybe where you're replacing a current model or a, a accepted um, study the, by the regulators, you know, as a, you know, to try to reduce animal numbers or use it to say that we kind of know what the outcome would be prior to performing that test, right? So to that second point, right, I, you know, I think that any time that we are trying to build an integrated risk assessment, that would be a, a really valuable area to, to kind of understand prior to going into humans if there's going to be a human risk or not. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And and Keith, you know, you've done a lot of work in toxicogenomics genomics and carcinogenicity. How, um, how do you see that that research fitting in in terms of incorporating prediction of human effects? 
right? And, and really speaking to the, the points Warren just made, a couple couple areas there. Um, but we found, you know, the genomics has been useful on a couple fronts. One is to characterize the models and really have to understand these in vitro systems and, and how they compare to um, in vivo. That's sort of a, a separate topic. But then on the the prediction of human um, effects piece, um, the ability to detect sort of prodromal effects um, has been really useful from, from two fronts. One is for toxicities where the animal models might not always be predictive. For example, um, liver injury where um, we don't always pick up the signals we see in human preclinically. And then the other would be to get earlier reads on toxicity. So for example, there would be um, the two-year CARSO studies we do in animals. Um, those are really resource intensive. And if we can use the um, yeah. prodromal markers to pick up signals earlier, we can get earlier reads and potentially not need to go out to two years. Great, thanks. And and Chu Yan and, and Deidre, do you have any other perspectives that you'd like to add on this question? And so I think, um, you know, in regards to utilizing those models, say for an integrated risk assessment, um, you know, basically, you know, we do sometimes and more than often than not, you know, see some sort of, you know, toxicity in, in say, the non-clinical species. And it's really understanding, you know, are those species, you know, more uh, prone to those effects and, and would they translate or not, like Warren said. And I think, you know, some of these models that are out there, whether they're, um, you know, 2D or 3D, you know, culture models, if, if these models are shown to be able to, they pick up potential, um, you know, known even potentially validated, uh, you know, clinical biomarkers to be able to understand um, looking across the various different, I would say, you know, species in those models, if they're characterized and they have a specific context of use, you know, you can potentially use that to help put into perspective whether, say, an animal may be, you know, more sensitive to a particular, you know, compound or a particular toxicity versus, you know, the, the human, you know, cell, cell system. Um, incorporating, of course, some sort of, um, say, known biomarkers or, or something that is well characterized, you know, in that model to understand whether, you know, a particular is, say, more sensitive to, to that and may not translate. But I think, you know, at, at GSK, you know, we are, you know, doing some of that and, and looking at those models to be able to incorporate that and into, you know, regulatory filing. Okay, so something that we're thinking of and looking at. Um, just have a one quick comment to add. I think, you know, um, many people has touched upon um, because I think every time we talk about the model, right, and a, a lot of time it's, a, it's almost like we need to define the question uh, a lot better as far as what we're asking from the model. So there is obviously a mechanistic, there is a prediction translation, and there's also a species um, comparison, right? Um, so I think related to those questions, I think a lot of time it is how much we know the model and obviously the better we know the model and you know we can help us better answer the question and how we can utilize model the more efficiently so so i i think a lot of time it just um uh, it's almost you know the, kind of utilizing the data to drive you know how and what kind of answer we can get from this model thanks yeah and and you know she along those lines as well you're you're involved with one of the projects within PSTC assessing, uh, you know, looking at, at tubular uh, injury to the, to, the, to the kidney, you know, how, how, what, you know, where do you see that fitting in for, for looking at human, human effects? Um, well, I think one thing, um, I, I think that kind of like before we answer that, because I think one of the mm -hmm. questions is that, you know, how the in vitro model, because a lot of times I think we have more, you know, preclinical um, toxicity data, right, than the human. So I think to me, there are two questions. One is, will the model predict the preclinical toxicity? And then how that linked to, you know, obviously translation to human. So I think the first question sometimes is more important um, because, you know, without the first question, obviously we can't answer the, um, the species comparison question. So related to the renal, because again, um, you know, back to you know, the earlier point, which I think many of you have touched upon, is how much we know the model, right? Um, especially, you know, related to the proximal tubule. Um, for example, you know, for me, is transporter expression is very important. Um, so back to, you know, the char characterization of the model. So it's definitely that something is needed um, for us to understand whether um, the mo model is valuable as far as, you know, toxicity um, 
um, prediction. Great, thank you very much, Shia. Um, this is an excellent question. Thank you, thank you uh, for for posting that um, from the audience. And and you know, I think along the lines of of looking at, at these pieces, some one of what, what we always come back to is is what are some of the appropriate you know in terms of of qualification. Uh, I think it, it's really important here, Shuyan, what you brought up in terms of refining the questions, and then also that the end piece. You know, what is the context that we want to use this in, or the context of use for qualification? Um, so the panels, I guess, you know, within um, your respective areas of expertise um, and, and primary work with PSTC across the, the skeletal muscle injury working group, the pancreatic injury working group, um, the, the nephrotox working group, and vascular injury, as well as is kind of in in, um, in, in carcinogenicity. What, what do you see as, as some appropriate contexts of use that would be applicable here? And um, with an alternative model. Um, well, 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 Nick, you know, please. Go ahead, Lord. No, no, hang on. That's okay. Oh, no, I was just going to throw additional um, mechanistic um, M, uh, sort of endpoint in there because I think for me, um, for model wise, right? Um, you know, obviously not mod all the models um, can answer all the questions. So I, I think it has some hypothesis as far as, you know, the potential mechanism for toxicity is very critical as far as, you know, how we can position each model differently. Um, so I, I can give, for example, a GI um, toxicity as an example, because some of the compounds, for example, you know, stem cell, focus on stem cell proliferation, right? Some of them might be impact on differentiation. Um, so what it means is that, you know, the model system has to carry certain characteristics. Um, does it have, you know, it, it probably, uh, meaning we have to dose a compound when we kind of a device model, we have to dose a compound at a different time frame so we can capture, you know, either as a proliferation stage or differentiation stage. So I, I, I think, you know, by having the hypothesis or at least some sort of uh, ideas how the compound cause the toxicity that will help us to better utilize this model system because because there are you know either endpoints different or either you know different time um time points is different as far as how we utilize the model thanks and and warren I think you had a, a, a response as well well you know i was going to go back to what i said earlier right so you know i think that any of these model systems that we're using internally in some of our, our companies, if they're for internal decision making, you know, I'm not necessarily sure I, I see the regulatory need, right? Because by the time the compound gets through into preclinical development, we've made a decision that we've de-risked some liability. And, and then it's just the standard battery of tests that we would use to support our translation to humans. You know, it's it's really the it's the the second and third categories I was discussing where I see that as the real driver for a regulatory endorsement, right? If we're making some sort of claim about, you know, a, a human liability that we can't detect preclinically, or vice versa, the preclinical toxicity that we see, how it's not human relevant, uh, those are really obvious areas to me where I think that the regulatory endorsement would really help the industry. And then, you know, the replacement, you know, Keith mentioned the, the carcinogenicity uh, work that's being done to try to, you know, potentially get waivers onto your bioassays. You know, that's something that you would definitely need some sort of regulatory interaction to, to and, and qualification of those particular markers, right? So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a start, right? I think a lot of our companies are working in these areas and, and it's, collective uh, PSTC team that actually can have help drive the evaluation phase. And then that's where I see the regulatory piece is, is critical. Great, thanks Warren. And, and then Deidre, you know, as, the, the, as one of the co-chairs of the vascular injury working group, where, you know, there is not a good um, set of biomarkers for detecting vascular injury in humans, how do you see um, you know models that models of vascular of the vascular system 
fitting into into the drug development paradigm for assessing safety and and de-risking uh, a compound or therapy or moving it forward so um you know with, within that space as you said there are no you know known you know biomarkers that can truly predict at the moment you know if we'll see drug induced vascular injury whether in animals or humans and i think you know within that uh i would within that space whether it be mechanistically say from toxicogenomics or um, you know, from models such as complex in vitro models, uh, some of the, you know, discussions amongst the drug and, uh, the, you know, um, drug and industry working group is, you know, we are, we do have a, um, an in vitro, you know, model, you know, part of, of that group at the moment. And, you know, we are looking at, you know, how that can complement or, you know, be able to um, uh, pull forward maybe some additional opportunities for us in that space. Um, you know, looking at those models from the sense of, you know, how, how would we do that? You know, we have, um, we know we see uh, non-clinical drug-induced vascular injury. We don't know right now whether it would be uh, translatable to, to the clinic or not. And, um, you know, based off of what we're doing there is, you know, we're looking at the various different uh, cellular components that are involved in, in developing those lesions. They're, the mechanism's not completely understood. So utilizing potentially those models, if, if they can be characterized in, say, non-clinical species, uh, you know, like that was uh, discussed before, um, and understanding that we have models that can actually predict um, what will happen in, in the non-clinical species. If you then have, you know, a clinical model with, um, you know, human, human cells that you know um, you know, based off of looking, say, at other compounds within that space are behaving and uh, the, I would say, how you would expect pharmacologically or physiologically in, in, from those human cells, like, could you then utilize that and um, to potentially de-risk, you know, molecules where you're, you're seeing, um, you know, effects in, in those uh, in vitro models, but you're not seeing it in, in the human model. And, um, you know, it's really a... Um, I would say it, it'll take time to be able to do that, but it's really, uh, I would say, a weight of evidence approach, I would say, in, in those respects. And hopefully in the future, you know, there are, you know, we do identify some, you know, clinical biomarkers or a panel of biomarkers potentially that may be, and whether that's looking in those models at, you know, toxicogenomics or, you know, potentially qualified biomarkers in that space to help, you know, de-risk that before we can, can move forward. But um. I mean, we do we do see the use the utility of it, and we're starting to really um, investigate that. And various different companies that I know that are involved in you know PCC are either doing it internally or you know working with vendors to be able to try to you know get a better understanding of, of that space, including you know which is thought now to you know need to be microphysiological systems and induce food food flows, your stress potentially. So it's really getting that right and understanding the context of use of all of those. Thanks, Tetra. And, um, and, and Madhu, you know, with your perspective, you, I, I, you know, you brought up both kind of a heart on a chip and a liver on a chip as, as areas mm -hmm. to, to pursue, but what, you know, what are you seeing as questions that arise that are not easily answered from some of the non-clinical species in safety assessment um, on, on the FDA side? You know, what do you see as your, your perspective here? For some some questions that you would like um, better better addressed or in um, in discussions with with applicants. Right. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, I actually uh, uh, sort of wanted to build up build a little bit on what I think Warren mentioned with carcinogenicity. Um, you know. As as this this community knows, uh, there are no good um, uh, you know. Prior to going into the sort of the the uh, the animal models, there's no good evaluation really of of carcinogenicity for a lot of small molecules, especially. And I think uh, that if there are model systems that are able, so in sort of marrying uh, the field of investigative toxicology to 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 almost a regulatory toxicology, if there were ways that you could red flag certain. Um, certain uh, molecules or at least sort of um, give more information on carcinogenicity for a lot of things that may or may not show up in in the animal model being tested. I think that is an area that um, we are very interested in. 
Great, thanks. We, we have about nine minutes left in today's uh, webinar. Are there any final questions that the audience would like to ask? We have time for one more question. Nick, we have a, a, a question um, here from Amita Parikh. So this is a question for all of the industry panelists. Um, have you used these systems in later phases of drug development? Um, for example, to address clinical questions that may came, come up at or after phase one? And if so, what kind of questions and how did the CIVMs help? Yeah, Keith, you want to take this one or should I? <laughs> so, so I'll start, Keith, and chime in. So, uh, one of the examples we were talking about earlier was our understanding of human dilly and, and maybe the lack of prediction in some of the non-clinical species. So, we have had um, many examples where we have seen later phase dilly in humans where we did not see that liability in our um, non-clinical species. And we've used some of our in vivo, or I should say, toxicogenomic tools to show that we could have understood the potential risk for the human dilly in, um, in animals, in rats specifically, right? So we now leverage that information to understand if we may have late clinical failures due to DILI that we would just typically not see preclinically. Keith, anything to chime in on that? Yeah, I mean, just to, to say more specifically, one example um, around react metabolism and, and bioactivation, um, we talked about it in a, a recent manuscript or experience with the CGRP compounds and a history of um, some liver signals there once we got into the clinic that were clean preclinically. And we're able to de-risk those compounds um, using these approaches, looking at some of these um, prodromal markers I was mentioning using genomics in the rat, where the rat doesn't get the toxicity, but we can see the, um, the early effects of the compounds that um, the rat is able to handle, but are showing up as um, liver injury in the clinic. That's very nice example. Thank you. Uh, DJ and, and Amita. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Warren. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going to say, Amita, that's, those are the issues that we really want to try to avoid with some of these systems, right? You know, in the industry, that, that's the worst situation we can ever be in is when we see a human toxicity, especially in phase three, after the investment of time and resources, where we just didn't have the systems in place you know, non-clinically to, to screen out that issue. So, yeah, well, we see it, and when it happens, um, we realize that, that, that that's a huge loss for, for everyone involved. Thanks, Warren. All right, Suyan or Deidre, do you have uh, any, any examples that you'd like to, to present right now? Um. I want to say that I have a, you know particular examples to I would say highlight, but I, I would say within that space, you know, we do have, you know, that happen, you know, occasionally where we do see some, you know, clinical findings, and you know what we do in those respects is really looking back and trying to identify those, like what we're talking about, alternative solutions as to one get a better mechanistic understanding of what what may be happening and. In some instances, you know, we can potentially identify, like Warren said, something that, you know, maybe we could have picked up, you know, sooner. Um, more times than not, it's, you know, not that simple. And it's, you know, really being able to understand um, what what is happening, like what, what the cause of that is, and then kind of retrospectively looking back and saying, you know, based off of what we learned from that, how can we then apply that, you know, to future projects? And, um, you know, what kind of models can, can we look at more from a predictive standpoint? based off of the knowledge that we're gaining from the clinic and kind of do it, you know, reverse translationally to say, you know, what, what can we then develop in, in those alternative models to help you know, predict, you know, move forward in the future. Thanks, teacher. And, and Xu Yan, did you have something to highlight? Uh, I think everybody covered it uh, very, very well. You know, obviously, 
Um, this is something we do observe, not only that, sometimes we also observe the difference, obviously, between rodent and dog. Um, so, as Deidre was saying, you know, a lot of times it's almost like a proactive approach um, for now um, to understand, you know, the really get down to, you know, the mechanism, hopefully <clears throat> in the future we can, you know, um, sorry, reactive approach, hopefully in the future we can be more proactive um, for those kind of um, issues. Thank you. All right. Well, here we're closing in on um, on the ninety minute mark for for today's uh, webinar. Are there any final comments from our panelists and, and presenters you'd like to make before we close out? I have just one quick comment um, because I know we're talking about the alternative, um, different, you know, the MPS platform. So I kind of do want to say, which I think Madhu made the comment um, really resonate with me is. It doesn't mean our traditional 2D culture is useless. Um, so again, depends on the question, what we want to answer. So I still think, you know, simple 2D can offer a lot of information and they're um, to some extent a lot easier to run and low cost and we can answer certain questions. They're very specific question, obviously. So if we define our question, well, 2D system can be also useful. So just want to kind of comment that. So it's not just, you know, uh, going for the complicated and then we're not using the 2D anymore. So. Definitely, I think it's it is it's having the appropriate model to answer the question, and understanding what that model can answer and the limitations within that model. Definitely, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and close out today's session. Thank you very much, everyone, for for joining us. The this conversation and discussion was was excellent. We look forward to to future discussion and, and see this as a as a starting point to to future collaboration and and work in this space. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our our panelists here today, as well as the presenters. Um, a thank you to our CPATH team for for organization here, uh, particularly Laura Hopkins. Thank you very much for for your work and. Um, Go to the next slide. I would like to invite everyone to our upcoming um, webinars to celebrate the 15 years of PSTC. In November, we'll be having one on biomarkers of effect, looking at safety biomarkers as disease biomarkers. And then in January, we'll we'll close out a little bit after 15 years and 16 years. Um, the uh, presentation looking at how collaboration begets innovation, PSDC's relationships leading the way for collaboration outside the consortium. So, so you know, how, how collaboration within the consortium is, is pr productive as well as looking at synergies across consortia. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the, the links will be sent out to all who have attended and registered for these events with, um, with links to the slides and uh, recorded presentations. And we look forward to seeing you in November.